One of my favorite bye week traditions is chatting with Greg Thompson about the upcoming offseason, and that's exactly what we're going to do today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, folks, I'm joined by Greg Thompson today here on the podcast. If you guys don't know Greg Thompson, he's the outstanding host of the Cover One Buffalo podcast, also the Greg Thompson Sports Show. You can follow him on Twitter at Greg Thompson. I love talking big picture stuff, salary cap, roster management with Greg, and he's here right now. Greg, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Always uh, always fun to, to jump on and be able to go through where we stand. And, and this season, it's kind of nice to step back for a second. It's yeah. been uh, quite a roller coaster going week to week with the team. So looking at, you know, obviously some fans are already looking ahead to next season we'll see uh each week we'll learn how important that will be but uh there is some information and some of it can look pretty scary initially well an essential part of my process of doing this podcast is talking to you you help me a lot with salary cap roster management people ask me questions typically i ask you that question and then i answer the person you know what i mean so greg is my guy for all this type of stuff and so this is beneficial for me and it will probably get ahead a lot of the questions that you guys have for this football team uh, moving forward. And Greg actually did the uh, Buffalo Bills salary cap future special uh, end of last week on the Greg Thompson sports show. And so definitely check that out. And uh, we're going to get into a lot of those dynamics here today, but I want to start by setting the tone here. I don't want to get too specific, but I want this conversation to begin by getting into our own perspectives on how the team should approach this coming off season. It's a, it's a unique position that they are in their life cycle. There's some aging parts of this roster. There's some exciting young parts of this roster. A lot of questions. You know, you, the Dolphins are probably going to win this division. I know we'll play all the rest and see what happens. Where are you at, Greg? What's kind of just generally your thoughts on how to attack this coming offseason? So I think the first part is having a healthy view of what has happened this year. And I think that obviously there are a lot of valid questions. I think there's obviously a critical one at, at head coach and um, s- some other very important questions to ask. But ultimately, a great deal of the results, and this is not an excuse, there's, it's a reason that that coach is being discussed and, and other questions at play, is because of really bad injury luck and really weird one-score you know, game luck. Um, and luck sounds like an excuse, but it's very real. We see the swings that different teams go through from season to season. So I I think part of it is accepting that it's not actually as bad as it feels. And I think all of the advanced metrics showing how actually talented and good this team is shows that it's frustrating because we're not winning. So that's all that matters in the moment. But when you're projecting going forward, the reason that you still see the whether it's the Vegas, you know, favorites or, or the different score predictions or, you know, that the game against Philadelphia is a perfect example. They were dominating what is, you know, arguably the best team in the NFL. And they still found a way to loss, lose, because that's what we do this season. We find ways to lose. Yeah. Um, but that, I think, is the prism you need to view the future through in that this is not a rebuild situation to me. I mean, if you want to argue about reload and things like that, are there spots we can do a little bit of a, a cleanup effort? Sure. Um, but this is very much a reload area for me. And I think as we get into some of the contracts, 
you know, the Bills have 44 players under contract next year. That's much more than many other teams. Um, so a lot of teams that actually you'll look at with, oh, my gosh, how do they have so much cap space? Well, it's because they don't have like four of their top six players signed for next year. So, yeah, they, they have a lot mm -hmm. of cap space, but they also don't have the talent that they do now. The Bills have the majority of their high-end talent all retained coming back next year. I think you can argue that, you know, maybe their top 10 players are, are all uh, under contract with uh, – maybe one notable exception. I, I appreciate that perspective. I think it's good perspective and the margins are pretty slim in the NFL, right? I mean, the bills are three back in the loss column to the dolphins right now in the AFC East. And that's because the dolphins have won the games they are supposed to win. And the bills didn't, right? They, they lost to the Patriots. They lost to the jets. They lost to the Broncos, not to mention some of the other games. Right. And so while the dolphins are take care, taking care of their business, the bills missed their chance to take care of their business. And now they need to, get some help and really take care of their business the rest of the way. When I consider my own perspective on this coming off season, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Here's where I, this is going to influence a lot of my thoughts. I'm not going to be afraid of some resets. I think that's where I'm at. I think there are some expired parts of this operation, especially when you project it beyond this year. And so while there's a lot of players that I like, I'm not going to find myself stressing out about some of these older players that um, have had a bit of a decline, maybe some late career injury stuff. And, you know, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I'm just not going to because I think that they need to get a few resets, whether it's age, whether it's some money in some certain areas. And so I thought that was important for us to distinguish that as we're going to get really specific moving forward, just generally how we are considering uh, this football team. So now that we've talked about the philosophy, let's get into the numbers and folks make sure that you are paying attention here. A lot of information coming your way. I got a notebook, so uh, <laughs> I'm ready to go, Greg, right now. And again, we'll get into all the levers that they can pull. Right now, what is the Buffalo Bills projected cap space entering the 2024 offseason? So right now, the number is that the Buffalo Bills will be 29 million point two. It's $29,168,012. Uh, I can kick in the 12 bucks. I, I'm going to send them a check for the 12 okay, bucks. Very good. Get it, do it I'll, nice be, I'll send in six. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> we're good. We're good. We, yeah. We'll split it. Uh, so obviously, $29 million over the cap looks very, very scary. We're technically the second highest over the cap besides the Saints. So some of those old Mickey Loomis years mm -hmm. where it looks really scary going into the offseason, especially people who are not as comfortable playing with the numbers, we are at a legitimately intimidating starting point, 29 million over the cap. Now, good to know. Also, levers, right? We've learned about yeah, levers yeah. and we've learned about banana stands, all that type of stuff. Where is he getting the money? Who are the restructure candidates? Who are the cut candidates, the reasonable cut candidates? So I think from a restructure standpoint, there are four really easy ones. And anytime you're looking at restructures, my definition is, you restructure a contract that there's no risk of you wanting to release. Yeah. So now sometimes you can restructure over four and five years, like the, the following four seasons. Nobody can see four years into the future. So I always use the next two to three. If there's any risk that you might want to release that player in the next two years, I would hold the line. So these are guys that I just don't see any scenario where we're going to release them. It's, it's free money in the sense that it's a, it's an interest-free loan from the future. You can borrow money from yourself in the future with no interest, no downside. You're just pulling some money forward on a player that you're going to keep no matter what. We'll deal with the rest later. Um, so the smaller ones, uh, a guy like Connor McGovern. I think he's been a really nice addition. I don't think there's any chance we're going to want to get out of that deal. It, it's looking more and more like that'll probably be a likely extension candidate down the line. He's been a really nice addition. He's played great between Morrison and uh, Deion Dawkins. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's $3.2 million dollars every little bit helps. Um, we just extended that Oliver. A lot of people question that number in the off season. A lot of people are now celebrating that number in season mm -hmm. as he's, you know, top three or top five in most uh, defensive tackle statistics. That's another one. There's no risk that we're going to release at Oliver. That's another $3.6 million. Those are the two smaller ones. The two bigger ones are Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. Josh Allen the risk per se is obviously not that we're going to uh, release Josh Allen, but that in my opinion, either 2024 or 2025, one of those seasons, we need to take our medicine and not keep kicking that can down the road. We have restructured Josh Allen's contract every season since we did the extension because mm -hmm. it's just such an easy way to play with. 
restructuring him next year, it's $23 million. He single-handedly yeah. fixes all of the cap issues and gets us back to even. Um, I don't think we're taking our medicine next year. When I did, if anybody who does check out my uh, seller cap special, I did the comparison side by side in each of my groups of likely and, and less likely of, Hey, what would it look like if we did, you know, just take our medicine and let Josh keep moving along. I don't think that's going to happen this off season, but I think it's possible in 2025, especially if we do what the chiefs just did with Mahomes and kind of rework some of Josh's deal and bring his money up higher. That would make sense to do all of that in 2025. So we'll see where that one goes. Stefan Diggs, for me, is a receiver that I think is going to age really well. Right now, there's no real scenario. I, I've joked that Stefan Diggs knows we can't do anything with his contract, but the Bills also know that Stefan Diggs can't get out of his contract. So mm -hmm. everybody's kind of at this Mexican standoff of, yeah, he can say outlandish stuff, but he also knows he can't say trade me or get me out of here because they just can't. Um, this would continue that. This would continue that Mexican standoff, uh, but it's $13.1 million. If we pull those small handful of levers, all of a sudden you go from a $29 million hole to $23 million in cap space. $23 million in cap space is by itself without we're going to go over some more extensions and I haven't even done any releases yet. Yep, yep. Th that gets us into fully functioning space. Those restructures, I think, are very likely – I won't be shocked if they hold the line on digs because they can work around it if they want to. But I, with some of the pending uh, either expiring contracts or players, you need to replace them. I expect them to pull each of those levers. All right. We're at a good place right here. We're going to talk cut candidates. We're going to talk about what the real number could be. You know, Greg said 29 million over. We've already gotten ourselves in a good position we're going to get a lot more into reality here in just a moment. But first, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. This time of year, it can be challenging for some people, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change, something to look forward to to make you feel grounded and to give you the tools necessary to manage everything going on. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the very best version of yourself. It isn't just for those who have experienced major trauma. So if you've been thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire. That'll get you matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. All right, Greg. Let's get back into this. We we went through the restructure candidates, and you came up with four very logical ones. Who are some of the cut candidates, players that you can reasonably see being let go, and that represents a cap savings? So, again, the same way that I kind of have a definition as I go when I look for restructure candidates, when I look for release candidates, it's pure valuation. Um, so I – and probably more afraid of dead cap than I should be. Some teams are getting more and more comfortable eating that dead. When you hear people talk about dead cap, all it means is, is there cash you've already paid the player that you haven't accounted for on the salary cap yet. So if you already paid them the cash, but you kicked it down the line, you did a restructure, you did a signing bonus and you haven't accounted for it yet. Even if you release them, you still got to account for it because you already gave them the cash. Yep. So I look for players that we don't have that or have minimal amounts of that, or that the value of what you release them for is so much higher than what they would get on the open market or what they represent to the team. So I have two obvious ones and then four that I'll list because I think they're within the decision-making process. Uh, the first is Deontay Hardy, probably my biggest miss uh, as a content creator and as a analyst here this year. I was very excited what I thought they were going to be able to do with Deontay Hardy and what I thought he was going to add to the, the Bills roster. Obviously, that not only hasn't happened, but all the way to the point of him being a healthy scratch this past week. Um, if we release him, it creates $4.1 million in available cap space. Obviously, it does not look like he's going to be a $4 million plus uh, receiver on the market to any team. Um, so I think that's an obvious and easy one. The second one that I have is maybe a little cold because – he didn't choose to get hit by a jet ski. That's just mm. really sucky luck. But if you release Naheem Hines, it's $5 million. Um, I actually could see almost a Jordan Phillips situation here where he gets released or becomes a free agent 
and then maybe things pan out and he comes back. I just, I don't know that Naheem Hines in the current health situation and the current running back marketplace has a lot of leverage beyond maybe a Damian Harris $1.77 million deal. Mm -hmm. Um, $5 million is way too much. I won't be shocked if they reach that, the exact scenario that I just discussed internally and it's a they call it they let the agent call it a restructure but it's just very plainly a, a pay cut um i won't be shocked at that but right now i have it as five million dollars as a release and just too easy to take um sam martin is another one uh 1.25 million last year was perfectly reasonable to be a slightly more than minimum paid punter and i was good with him coming back because there was stability and good holding ability this year we've had less stability with tyler bass and horrendous punting uh beyond a couple minimal ones so uh, i think that's an easy one you're saving money and hopefully we address that in the draft or somewhere where we can get a more sustainable cost controlled uh punter the toughest one for me is because of the impact from the team is saran neal um, it's 2.88 million in savings. I, I think he's still viewed very highly as a impact special teams player, but our special teams have been pretty bad this year. Yeah. So I, it's hard to argue how much impact is he having if, if, uh, if we're playing as poorly as we are. And we've seen other guys like a Terrell Dodson, like a Cam Lewis, like a Taylor Rapp can be a core special teams guy and at least be a net neutral as a defensive scrimmage player. And I don't think I've seen that from Saran Neal. So if I'm going to have someone that's going to be a, you know, listed as an ace, I need more impact on the overall coverage units, or at least I need some contribution uh, on defense. I don't know that the team's going to do that. Uh, I think the team might view that differently, but for me, that would be uh, an easy one. Then you kind of pointed in a direction where uh, I think there's some difficult ones coming and I'll go on two sides of the coin. Some people are going to bring up Mitch Morris, which to me, I, I think is crazy. It's the best offensive line season we've seen in Josh Allen's career. I want nothing to change. I want mm -hmm. all five of those guys to be there. Um, I get it that there's a bit of a luxury between Ryan Bates and Mitch Morris. I'm not so sure that, hey, if we just release Mitch Morris and insert Ryan Bates, everything will stay the same and be just as good. And if you do release Mitch Morris, it's $8.5 million. It's a it's a, a material number that, that does matter. I don't want to change anything on the offensive line, but I'm not naive to not list it as a possibility in the same way that releasing Jordan Poyer is also $5.5 million. I know I'm pulling at the nostalgia of just what I know Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde have been to this team. But like you touched on earlier, there's probably some resets needed here. Uh, Jordan Poyer was never a terribly fast or athletic player, so I don't know if he's lost a step or anything like that because he wasn't to begin with. But it's becoming more noticeable on some of the angles, some of the moments in space. Uh, he still makes impact plays. He still does some good things that I like having him on the team, but I'd be crazy not to see the possibility because the math plays out. So I think Mitch Morris... $8.5 million is a very enticing number. I want to keep that. Uh, I won't be shocked at maybe some restructuring uh, mm -hmm. that's actually a pay cut and they find a way to keep him there uh, or simply let him stay at the number he's at. Same thing, Jordan Poyer. I think he's already at the lower end of what he would get, uh, but it's naive to think that that's not a possibility to release. So I think Naheem Hines, Deontay Hardy are very easy ones. Sam Martin is an easy one. I would have Saran Neal as an easier one. I don't know if the team will. And then uh, Micah or uh, Jordan Poyer and Mitch Morris, I think, are possibilities just because the number is big enough to consider it. You hit you hit the ones I I, I thought you would. Um, and and so what what gets us to this interesting point? And let me say something about Deontay Hardy. The dude's just not the same from the turf toe injury, right? Like, he's I watched him on tape. I got excited too. He's not that guy. <laughs> so so that's where I think we can appreciate the loss a little bit. Yeah. Um, there, it's just the injury took something from him. All right, so we've went through this whole deal of restructure candidates, cut candidates. What's the realistic range of cap flexibility you anticipate Brandon Bean having? Like, I know that you probably have all the numbers. If he pulls every lever, it can be this. Oh, yeah. But what's the reality here? Uh, so if anybody wants the if he pulls every lever number, I – so Brandon Bean and his staff is smarter than I am. Um, I just can play around with numbers on the internet and can go through. I can get us – 
to well over $52 million in cap space without even crazy. That's a, not literally restructuring every single deal. That's just with the handful. I think I did 12 different moves. I can get us to 52 million in cap space. So they can do whatever they want to do. Yeah. There are no limitations. Everything, everything is possible with the banana stand from a realistic standpoint. Uh, if we go through those four base salary restructures that I listed and let's say the f- top four releases. So not releasing um, either Jordan Poyer or Mitch Morris, but we release the special teamers, Hines and Hardy. Um, and with no extensions, there's some extensions that can also create additional uh, mm-hmm. cap space. All of a sudden, I already have us at $28 million in cap space. So you can get to 28, 29 just at that with just the handful of releases, which are replacement level players and a handful of restructures of nobody that's going anywhere. We haven't done anything crazy. We haven't mortgaged the future and we're already at $28 million in usable cap space. All right. Well, we are going to get into the extension candidates. We have a loaded final segment coming up, including Greg Rousseau's fifth year option, some Albatross contracts and that I know people are thinking about as well as the expiring deal. So stick with us a lot more to get to here today. But look, folks, when you're trying to get tickets, you shouldn't have to worry about the stress that goes into the ticket buying process. And that's why you have to check out Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy all the tickets for the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. The app is awesome. They have killer deals on last minute prices, last minute tickets. You can get all in prices. They give you a view from your seat. They have a best price guarantee. They give you flash deals. They send the f- tickets right to your phone and not your emails. I mean, simply put, st- the game time has perfected the ticket purchasing process. So you can snag the tickets without the stress with game time. So download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Greg. You mentioned extensions. You know, we should we should we should definitely get to extensions. I want to look at the ex- well, let's do extensions because extensions are important because it can get us even more cap space. That's okay. the fun thing about that. So, looking at extensions, and I don't want to talk about the expiring contracts. Let's leave that right. separately. Guys that are still under contract through twenty twenty four. Who are some of those names that that come up for you? So there's three guys for me that really check a lot of the boxes. Again, these are guys that. Hey, we think there's, you know, value beyond here. And not only is there value beyond the 2024 season, it also helps us in 2024 to create cap space. So there's yeah. three of them. Um, the easiest one is Taron Johnson for me. Matter of fact, the easiest one for me is Taron Johnson. Maybe the hardest one in that I he might have earned himself a, a pretty healthy pay raise. I don't know exactly that we're seeing that nickel cornerback market become a little more recognized. We got him for three years and eight million dollars a year, three years, 24 million. I'm going to be pretty surprised if that's still his price. I think that's going to get into the double digits, maybe 11, 12, 12 and a half million dollars. Um, it's still a, a sizable benefit. And, and I think something that we can really uh, be able to take advantage of, uh, we can say $4.7 million against the cap by extending him based on that final year, get him a little extra cash, keep him around. You're talking about him, um, you know, going into, I think, his age uh, 28 season. So I think two more years after that is very, very sizable, uh, very reasonable to manage, um, and I would go that route. Uh, Deion Dawkins is another one. We're at the exact That's same stage. That's the easy one for me. We're at the exact same stage where we did this with Mitch Morse. We had the initial yeah. contract. He got exactly to this point in his career. We added on two more years because everything was going well. That's another one that's $7.1 million in cap space. Um, It's super, super easy. They're currently set up as void years, so they're literally already on his contract. We just insert some salary into those two years and keep them. That's age 31 and 32. That is completely reasonable for an offensive lineman, uh, and he's having arguably his best season of his career. Super, super stable, and obviously having a uh, uh, the stability next to him at left guard with Connor McGovern has been exactly what we were hoping for. And that the concern we had in the off season of, Hey, was that step back him or how much of that was him trying to make up for Saffold? Um, I think we can tell ourselves a, a healthy amount of that was him trying to make up for Saffold. Um, so those two are pretty easy ones to me, I guess, depending on the number, I think Dion is the easiest one to be like, Hey, let's just keep rolling this along at 15 million a year. We appreciate you. You appreciate us. Let's keep it rolling. He's great off the field. He's our NFL player, the uh, man of the year candidate. 
the third one I think is is easy is Rasul Douglas. Um, when we traded for him, we inherited a final year at it's basically like a almost like a team option because nothing's guaranteed and there's six million dollars in salary and then another 2.25 million in an early roster bonus where they would talk before that and be like hey if you liked it here we want you for next year that number is perfectly clean we also would like to extend that for another year or two beyond there uh you know his skill set and style of play is not based on like lock him up man-to-man skills it's on his using his brain and reacting and playing in zone with the length and size that he has he's done that in spades like Mm -hmm. it's been a perfect fit that's another one 5.9 million dollars in extension space i would say dion and taryn are more likely just because in-house known commodity already have signed extensions with the team you're just rolling that along I would like to see it with Rasul Douglas as well, but obviously there's more variables in play there, whether he wants that. Uh, Plus they already have another season under contract. They don't have to do anything. They can just keep it going into the next year. Those are the cleanest and easiest ones for me of guys. They're all expiring after 2024. So they're coming up on their final year. Those are the guys you look to extend. They're all healthy. They're all playing well. And there's benefit for the team in the short term with the cap space. Have to think something's going to happen with Rasul Douglas's deal because it's there's no dead cap, right? It's like a clean. Is it nine yep. and a half million? Or so I might be off on that number, but it's it's right around there. And so I don't I don't expect nothing to happen with Rasul Douglas, but obviously a good opportunity there. I would agree with you on those extension candidates. You kind of hit the three that I would anticipate you hitting. Let's talk expiring contract. These are these are players that they're they're either going to be back on a new deal or they're going to be playing for some other team. Yep. Um. I want to get to the interesting ones and and kind of acknowledge all of them. So I'll I'll kind of steer us here and we can interject as needed. A quarterback, Kyle Allen's your your expiring contract. So the Bills will either need to bring him back or find a new QB2. At running back, it's Latavius Murray, Damian Harris, Ty Johnson. I think we can all agree that those are minimum contract type players. The Bills want him back. Small, small deals. Wide receiver, things get interesting. You got the big one here. Gabe Davis and then Trent Shurfield. I'm not sure that we've seen enough from Trent Shurfield. That makes us say, let's get him back. But I think Gabe Davis warrants a little conversation. Um, I, I think the whole world knows where I stand on Gabe Davis. I know there's other opinions out there. Sure. But when you when you project Gabe Davis and his market value, what what is the range that, you, that you're looking at with, with him? So the challenge for me is I, I, th- I see a ton of parallels with Tremaine Edmonds. Uh, with Tremaine Edmonds, we saw a – draft and develop homegrown talent who flourished uh, here, was a team elected captain, had negotiations on extensions going into his final year. Then they decided, hey, we're going to take it into the season and see how it goes. And then the market value didn't align with the team's valuation. Obviously, they're already not aligned or else they would have already extended. I think that those extension talks were very, very real and probably... I don't know how how to estimate close, but um, I think this substantial offers were exchanged back and forth, and they didn't come to an agreement. Now, it's really hard to say, like Edmonds probably played better in his final year than Davis has so far, but there have been flashes. There have been multiple 100-plus yard games and multiple touchdown games, and the free agent wide receiver market is, is interesting. There are some names out there. There's some depth out there. A lot of those guys are going to resign before the season comes. So I don't expect all of those names Mm -hmm. to make it to the free agent market every single year. It's like half the names that we see initially actually make it. So I think that they are going to see themselves as a uh, Cortland Sutton as a Christian Kirk, as a a player that's going to go out there and get 14, 15, $16 million a year. Uh, and that he just hasn't had the opportunity to be uh, more of a maybe not a number one, but a one A one B kind of situation where the, where he can do that. Um, you know, I, I think initially the Bills were probably seeing him as a Jacoby Myers kind of guy, and, and you know, a, a ten eleven million dollar a year player. Um, I think it's debatable if he's even played up to that at this point from a consistency standpoint. So. I really this is going to need to be a Jordan Poyer situation for me where I don't see a number where they agree unless it's shockingly low. Yeah. Unless it comes back and it's oh my god, I can't believe he stayed for 2 years and 16 million dollars. Um and so I I think he's going to get 
twelve and a half million dollars in the marketplace. I think there'll be enough teams looking for uh, a free agent. There'll be people that tell themselves um, that he was just playing in the shadow of Stefan Diggs. Some of the underlying metrics will show that oh, we think we can harness that and, and take it further. I wouldn't be shocked if he signs like a three year, thirty seven point five million dollar deal uh, in Houston or in Atlanta mm-hmm. or, or somewhere where um, I think they'll tell themselves or Arizona where they'll tell themselves they can get more from that. Um, I don't see that being in Buffalo, but they like him a lot. I think he likes it in Buffalo, uh, but I think it would be maybe not quite as much of a tail between his legs as what Jordan Poyer was coming back for as cheap as he did, but that's the only path where I could see him staying in Buffalo. And he's young. He's 24 years old, yeah. right? I mean, that's that's an interesting dynamic Also a there. day three pick and has not had big NFL money yeah. to this point. Yeah. Yeah, all very worthy talking points there with Gabe Davis. I think without getting in the merits of extending Gabe Davis, I think the Dawson Knox contract, which we're going to get to, I think that makes it hard to yeah. really pay both of those guys. And I feel like and when also they made maybe that choice, scares Bean a little. It should, it should, <laughs> candidly. Uh, offensive line expiring contracts too here. David Edwards, Jermaine Effetti, love to have them both back on a minimum type deal, especially Edwards, who's been a jumbo tight end. You know his his. <laughs> His time as a starter gone. Uh, what has he done this year to change his market? Right, that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, would love to have him back if if that works yeah. out. Defensive end, it gets interesting. Shaq Lawson, minimum type player, but AJ Epinesa is another one of those guys that uh, warrants a little conversation here. Um, I, I said yesterday that my approach with AJ Epinesa is, I think he's kind of around a five to six million dollar a year defensive end. I, I brought up Dorrance Armstrong. I brought up Dietrich Wise. I brought up Anthony Nelson as parallels there. But AJ Epinesa is probably a player that might want to test the waters. And like, dude, if there's three years, $30 million out there from somebody, go take it. You're, you, you get two years, 11 here. What, your thoughts on Epinesa's market? So I think we've now gotten ourselves into a situation, obviously, Von Miller's situation aside, like short of us, you know, some new information coming yeah. available. Um, I think we're going to have to choose between Leonard Floyd or AJ Epinesa. I don't think there's any scenario where we can keep both. I think we could choose one. Uh, There's a chance both of them price themselves out because both of them are producing at a exceptional level from a, you know, from the flashy numbers standpoint to get paid. Uh, Floyd is actually doing it across the board with genuine pressures, his win rate, his pressure rate. Um, That one is very, very real in, you know, all uh, senses of it. AJ, I think, is having a good, like a not Jordan Phillips lucky in his final season before he walked uh, to yeah. go to Arizona, uh, but has some good fortune in some of his numbers. It's probably not quite as much as the sack production is saying, but that won't stop, you know, Carolina or Atlanta or somebody throwing him. Like you said, I, I had it at three years, 27 million, uh, like nine million a year. And mm-hmm. I don't know that he's a nine million dollar a year guy we just got leonard floyd for nine million dollars jadavian right. Clowney is playing uh really well in in uh baltimore there's that free agent pass rusher market is weird every single year i don't know that i want to invest longer term in a big number in aj Epinesa. again there is a number i'd keep him at that i'd be perfectly fine the numbers you threw around five or six yeah. million sure that, that'd be fine yeah. i'll be shocked if that's what he signed for matter of fact i he's not going to sign for that he's, he's going to get more money than that um and right now, the production is still so strong with Leonard Floyd. I would rather do Gregory Rousseau, Leonard Floyd, and, and then restart the cycle with another draft pick, uh, you know, yeah. so, somewhere there for it. So I think Epinesa is going to get paid more. If Shaq Lawson comes back as your fourth or fifth D end, I won't be upset. He's still a, a functional player. But again, at a, at a, he's been a minimum contract player for a bit now. Leonard Floyd, yeah, I overlooked him in the in, in initial setting the stage there. Four straight years of nine plus sacks. I mean, this guy's been really, really consistent, yeah. and so I, I'd love to to see something continue there. Although, I, I, true to my philosophy at the beginning, north of thirty player, like I'm not going to lose sleep over. It. I just I yep. can't put myself in that spot. And uh, they, we've obviously seen the marketplace. There are other guys like him. That yes. you can, I mean, you can. Are, we are getting a fantastic value for Leonard yes. Floyd. He is out producing his contract, and Jadavian Clowney's doing even more than that in Baltimore. Yep. So it's, you can, it's available. You can find these guys. Uh, defensive tackle, real interesting. Ed Oliver is the only one back. Daquan Jones, Jordan Phillips, Tim Settle, Puna Ford. Um, there's a few of these guys that I can tell to kick rocks. I know the hard ones here is uh, Daquan Jones, right? I mean, but this, again, my philosophy, north of 30, coming off of an injury, I'm not going to lose sleep here. But boy, oh boy, have I loved Daquan Jones with the Buffalo Bills. Kind of your thoughts here on this position group. So I think there's a, a confluence of factors here that make it 
a little easier because there's so much turnover that we have to bring somebody back. We're not going to just have all completely new names or all draft picks. Um, I think that I do want to see a legitimate draft investment here. I think that there's just too much risk to continue cobbling this together. I want to see a, you know, a premium draft investment here, top three round pick uh, yeah. a defensive tackle to solidify somebody there. And then I, my hope is that we get a discount on take on Jones because of the injury uh, that he was playing at an all pro level. He was Unreal. legitimately yeah. playing statistically and all you know, advanced metrics better than Aaron Donald before he got hurt. Like it was ridiculous what he was doing at the double team rate and the win rate, the pressures he was creating. Um, it was unbelievable. Um, I'm not going to pay for that, but I think that maybe the injury is going to let us. So, you know, when we brought him in here, it was, uh, you know, three years, 21 million, two years, 14 million. Um, I'll give him another $7 million a year to, you know, I haven't seen any reason that that's going to change. I think that if, somehow we pull out some miracle finish here. I, I actually think he's in line to come back and play in the playoffs. Um, that would be certainly very interesting to see beforehand. So I, not only am I okay moving on from Jordan Phillips and Tim settle, I don't want them to right. come back. I am right. fully ready for that. I've yeah. been confused. I think Puna Ford's played better than Tim settle. And I don't understand yeah. why settles getting the game day and giving Puna Ford's not, but they know, you know, they see things that I don't see. Yeah. So maybe there's something I don't know about what Puna Ford's not bringing to the table that they're not seeing. But if they brought back Puna Ford at another cheap contract as a, you know, a backup one tech or hell, Linval Joseph, if we just sign him and say, hey, you get to be on the physically don't feel like performing list for six weeks and then we'll bring you back after just don't pass your physical that's fine we'll keep you on the physically don't feel like performing list and then around week seven or eight we'll, week seven we'll open up your practice window you'll start playing at week nine it's perfectly fine just come be our backup one tech that just throws humans around regardless of how old you are uh he's still ridiculously big and strong so i'm yeah. fine with that but we need an injection of youth here at defense tackle Linebacker Tyrell Dotson, Tyler Medikavich. Medikavich feels a lot like the Saran Neal conversation. Like, all right, thanks for everything, bud. Time to find the next Tyler Medikavich. Tyrell Dotson, I know he's like PFF's number one linebacker, but I still think he's a minimum contract guy. Yeah, uh, I will say I I have been as critical of Tyrell Dotson as anyone out there, so I have to be fair. He's been okay. He really has. He, he's held his own a bit better than what uh, I, I've expected, but that's the bar was so low that that's not like huge praise. He has played better than than what, and maybe some of the you know slightly lesser responsibilities, playing more uh, snaps at will, has helped it. Not in the not to the level of Patrick Queen getting Roquan Smith, but hey, maybe taking some of that off of his plate has let him use what are some reasonable physical skills that, that he has. Um, so he's now gone to, rather than my Jordan Phillips or Tim Settle comments, he's now gone to the point where I don't mind if he comes back at a minimum deal. He plays a ton of special team snaps. He is reasonable depth here. Now having uh, a Terrell Bernard and knowing we'd get Matt Milano back, I don't hate him as a third linebacker in you know obvious rundowns and goal line sets and stuff like that. I don't want him out in coverage against anybody, but that's what a third linebacker plays. He played a lot of special teams, a lot of rundowns, a lot of goal line. I think we could do worse than Terrell Dodson as that third guy. Uh, so he's now at least shifted to the other side of the spectrum of to me of, all right, fine. He could be on the yeah. team next year. Yeah. Uh, corner Dane Jackson. This is his first time as an unrestricted free agent, if I'm not mistaken. So uh feels yeah, like he's valuable he, to the Bills. He had a day and a half of unrestricted free agency here oh. <laughs> where they right. did technically, they didn't uh, tender him and let him technically hit the market, but then they signed him for almost what the restricted yeah. tender. So it was one of those things where they pretty clearly had it worked out beforehand. And he just, I mean, he signed for like 500,000. It's great depth. Him. Right. But at some point does he, has he done enough to say, Hey, some team give me a shot, like for 3 million a year. Correct. That, that's where my head is at. Is, is this a Levi Wallace situation where, uh, we see a, him sign with, well, you know, maybe it's the Bengals uh, for three years and $12 million. And we, hey, you want to know what? God bless you. Go go right ahead. Go get your, your first chance at a real contract. Um, if he doesn't get that, of course, they'll welcome him back because they like him. And, and yeah. I think there's going to be, a, a, honestly, probably a little more than a minimum. It'll be another $2 million deal sitting here being like, hey, you can get it anytime you want. And if you get yeah. more than that, go ahead. But yeah. we got one year and $2 million waiting for you here. And 
as much as people don't love Dane Jackson when he's counted on, having him as your third or fourth corner in the NFL is a nice luxury. I'm okay. I, the same thing. I'm okay with him. Like I'm okay with Terrell Dotson. I don't want him playing all the time, but it's valuable depth. I don't mind it in that spot. Safety. There's several Micah Hyde expiring contract, Taylor Rapp, Cam Lewis. We already mentioned Jordan Poyer as a potential cut candidate. Is it time? Is it time to really flush here? Or... Um, I hate that the answer is probably, it probably yeah. is. Um, you know, not only, you know, how many more neck scares is Micah Hyde going to keep playing through? Um, you know, he's, he's a, a, a handsome young man with a beautiful family. You just go enjoy your life, man. I like, I, I won't be shocked now again. Lots of these guys have that warrior mentality and literally have to get dragged off the field. Um, I, I think Micah Hyde had very serious conversations about that this offseason. I think he wanted this season to end much differently than it's projected to end right now. Maybe we get a storybook end in here, but um, I, I think that he may make that decision. If he comes back, it would be very similar. I don't see him going and playing for somebody else. So I either think he decides he wants to play again, and it'll be they'll find a number that makes sense for the Bills, or he retires. I don't see him going elsewhere to play elsewhere. Um, now, the same thing as Jordan last year. Did, is that number the same number? I, I don't know. Uh, Not much of a market typically for older safeties. Like I think we've learned that. Um, Cam Lewis is a Terrell Dotson to me. He has value because he plays special teams and does other things. He's welcome to be on my roster for a while. Taylor Rapp is probably been a little less impact than I was hoping he was going to be. He's probably showed a bit more flaws. I think, you know, not, I'm not the only one at cover one who also was hoping this was a, um, kind of step program, a graduation program Same. where, Hey, we bring yeah. him in for a year, third safety, you get some minutes. And then all of a sudden you're part of the replacement plan. Now, I don't know if I want him to be part of the replacement plan. Like right. I, if he wants to come be that third guy again, I think again, he has, he's similar to Dane Jackson, he's similar to Terrell Dodson. Every fan gets so caught up in the, well, it can't be any worse. We got to go out and get some, just draft somebody. They got to be better than this one. No, they don't. They don't have to be better. There's lots of way worse guys out there than Terrell Dotson, Dane Jackson, and Taylor Rapp. But we don't want Terrell Dotson, Dane Jackson, or Taylor Rapp starting for us. So I hope we find better. But if all three of them come back in a valuable depth role at a $2 million or less price tag, I'll be fine with that. All right. A couple more things to get to here. Greg Rousseau. Uh, fifth year option decision coming for him. The Bills have before sometime early May to make that decision. But what's at stake? What are the implications here as the Bills navigate that? Uh, so I, I think I'm a little torn because my my initial instinct is, oh my god, this is super easy. Of course, they're just going to smash the button. And ultimately, I do think they will. I, I think that's the answer. Um, he's also been super close to almost really breaking out like yeah. four or five times and hasn't quite like he's been yeah. really good but hasn't had those moments i know he's playing through a weird foot injury and I, he probably needed this bye week as much as anybody on the roster so i'm hoping we see some of that finish that we started to see and so we saw some of those consistent pressure numbers really stacking up we've seen some other of the advanced metrics looking a little bit better um it, the challenge is he's an edge rusher Edge rushers get paid a ton. So he's on the basic version. There's four levels of the fifth year option. You have the highest is multiple Pro Bowls. Then you have one Pro Bowl, and that's not injury replacement Pro Bowl. That's like genuinely getting voted to the Pro Bowl. Then there's a playing time metric, which shockingly, the Bills, it kind of helps uh, that we do so much rotation that's kind of deflates where that number is. So he's on the most basic um, route to that right now at $14.6 million. The cheapest fifth year option for a defensive end is $14.6 million. That's a big number. Um, it's a hard number too. Hard 14.6. Yeah. Guaranteed, fully guaranteed. You cannot do anything with it. Now, I will say, Ed Oliver was the same thing. We picked up his option. Then we did the extension. He never saw that salary. That was just kind of the baseline for negotiations of where it would go. That's the ideal scenario is we pick up the option in the spring, which I think we will. He's been really, really good. It's a little more than what you'd love to see, but six eight six nine you know freak athlete defensive ends don't go to free agency they just don't Young, they they don't yeah. grow on trees so i expect us to do that i think it's going to start as a 
kind of hold your nose option pickup because it's a little more than you would like. And then ideally we see the exact same as that Oliver and he simply outplays the deal and we see an extension and everybody's happy. Last thing, Greg, and you and I are not capable of having a short conversation. Um, there, there's some albatross, albatross contracts. I think there's three deals that everybody is thinking about right now. Von Miller, Dawson Knox, and Tredavious White. What does Bills Mafia need to know about all three of these deals uh, so that we can have our mind in the right places and you know understand what's at stake with all of these players? So I'll start, I'll go in reverse order. Sure. Uh, so Dawson Knox, there is nothing we can do. Absolutely nothing. There is no way to slice and dice it. He is on this team. The contract was built for him to be on this team for the first couple of years of the deal. Next year, to cut him would be $20 million in dead cap space. It would cost $6 million more to cut him than to keep him. Yes, everybody brings up like the post June 1st number where we could kick some of that 20 million into 2025 uh, and technically make it possible where we'd save $1.9 million. You can not like Dawson Knox. You're not going to replace him as a tight end two for $1.9 million. He's better than that. Yeah. Um, it's It's not a good deal. It's not a good value. It's one of Brandon Bean's worst values uh, since like Starla Tule or, or Trent Murphy, but he's on this team. Nothing's going to change. In theory, if somebody traded for him, it's palatable. Who's trading for that contract? Nobody's Nobody. trading for that contract. He's on the team. Uh, you're giving, you're giving it. That's a Dawson Knox and a seven for a six. That's 100%. That's yeah. You're not yeah. getting anything right. in return. You just saying, keep and, Dawson Knox. And even with doing that, it creates two point seven million dollars yeah. in no. in uh, cap space. Are you going to go get a actual functional tight end two that can block and can catch the ball on occasion uh, for two point seven million dollars? No. So he's on the team. Nothing's changing there. Right. Um, Trey White's the hardest one for me because there is a number that is semi interesting. Um, in the early part of the deal, it, it's a ten million dollar dead cap hit with 6.2 million in cap space. You're now coming off the second career impact in injury. We, Aaron Rodgers aside and uh, listening to dolphin sex, I think helps your Achilles heal. If I understand uh, everything right. Uh, darkness retreats, ayahuasca. So hopefully Trey white is, is, uh, you know, diving into every possibility of helping his Achilles yeah. heal faster. It's a cornerback. Cornerback is not easy. Uh, I do think we, maybe miss how old Trey, Trey's only going, he's, he's 28. He's only going into his age 29 season. Um, I think it's possible he could play at a reasonable level. Is there any possibility he's going to play at a $16 million level? Probably not. So I envision him as the Mitch Morris conversation three years ago. So obviously we were at a point where the, um, concussion against Arizona and that weird situation. Yeah. And then we went into that off season thinking his career may be done. He hasn't missed a game since then. So obviously we're not always good at projecting what that is, but the team had a lot of leverage and it was a big cap number and they announced a restructure that was really just a pay cut to let him stay on the team. I won't be shocked at that. I think that's more likely than them going to a beloved team captain who just had bad luck on an injury that has made more technological and medical advancements than a lot of other injuries. I think that's more likely, but again, I'd be naive to say that it's not possible and $6 million isn't nothing if we released him, but we'd be eating 10 million plus keeping Trey not on the team to release him. That's a big number. I don't expect it, but I'm, I'm not going to go out and say it's not possible. It, it, it is possible. Uh, the final one is Von, Von Miller. Miller. <laughs> um, I, Everybody saw the news cycle. I yep. in the state of Texas, they're going to find out what is true and not true. We're not here to talk about that. If something does go down the path where it is proven to the point where the commissioner takes action to suspend him. Now, some people have a misconception about the commissioner's exempt list. Commissioner's exempt list is only for the 53 man roster. It does not have any salary cap relief. It does not change anything of what his cap hit impacts or going after any previous money. A suspension does. Uh, we saw Ezekiel Elliott suspended without any charges being filed or any conviction taking place simply because there was too much public information and they suspended him. 
if he gets suspended, it will void guarantees in his remaining contract, and it will let the team go back after previously paid bonuses for this season and the upcoming seasons. Um, if they don't, if none of that happens and all of this, uh, you know, either just doesn't reach a public conclusion, which many of these have private settlements and do not reach a public conclusion. Uh, if all of that happens, we will be in a position where there is not a good path. Von Miller was signed to a six year, $120 million deal with three years being fully guaranteed next year being that third year. Not only that, Earlier this year, we restructured some of his contract and basically made it a four-year deal. So next year, he has a $23 million cap hit. We could release him and have a $32.5 million dead cap hit. It costs $8.6 million more to release him than it does to keep him. Even if we get a suspension and voided guarantees and everything like that, it's $2 million in cap space. He's going to count 21 million plus in every scenario. Say this unfortunate, terrible incident turns out to be true and there's enough information that he's suspended and he never plays in the NFL again because that would be the right conclusion if, if that proves to be true. We still have to account for $21 million of Von Miller in next year on the cap. So out of any contract that could be listed as an albatross, that's the one. Well, ideally, Von Miller can get healthy and look something like Von Miller. I think that's the the best outcome. Ultimately, yeah, we, we likely, hope that, but that's the best. Yes, that's our best case scenario. Greg Thompson, an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thanks for giving us a bunch of your time here today to review all of this. You make us all smarter. You make me smarter, and really appreciate you giving us this much time. Uh, you're very, very kind. Really, really appreciate it, uh, and, and uh, appreciate everybody else uh, giving us a listen. Thanks, Greg, and thank you for being here today on this episode of Lockdown Bills. We're going to have another conversation tomorrow with Bruce Nolan of the Bruce Exclusive Podcast. We're going to talk about Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean and pass catchers and defensive back seven. It's going to be a great conversation, so don't miss it. Make sure that you are subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.